Good evening, Faith Family Church of God and guests. We're so glad that you're joining us tonight for this Wednesday night Bible study. Just a few announcements before we get started. And first off, as you're joining us tonight on this live broadcast, please leave a comment and a like and let us know that you're here so that we can know who all is watching our broadcast and know who we're fellowshipping with. Also, be watching and listening for an announcement about Sunday morning drive-in service that will come on Facebook sometime around Friday evening. And be sure to pray for one another and make contact with each other throughout the days ahead. We want to know, we want everyone to know that God's in control and we want an encouraging word and one encouraging word can change someone's outlook and reinforce their faith. We are praying for each and every <coughs> one of you daily. We love you. And we want God to bless you in the coming days. Also, remember that Faith Family Church of God has a YouTube channel. So go on YouTube. If you haven't already subscribed, go on YouTube. Type in Faith Family Church of God. It is the blue and black logo that pops up. It says, You Belong Here. Click on that link. It'll take you to our YouTube page. And click the red subscribe button below our name. That's just like liking a page on Facebook. It lets everybody know that you're following us. And it lets us know that you're in following on us. And click the bell across from the subscribe page to get texts and alert notifications about when we go live, when we upload videos and sermons and lessons, or when we upload an announcement. Right now we are at 29 subscribers. And I want to thank everybody who has subscribed thus far. But for those who haven't, subscribe, 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 and get the word out to your family and friends about our YouTube channel. Because I believe that God has placed it on mine and Sister Brenda's heart to really be a ministry tool in this coming time, in this current time, and in the coming time in the future. So subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Also, remember that there are a few ways you can continue to support your church. First of all, remember to pray for your church. That's wonderful support for your church. Your church and your church family needs your prayers. Secondly, you can support your church through giving. You can mail your support to Faith Family Church of God, P.O. Box 97869, Pearl, Mississippi, 39288. Again, that is Faith Family Church of God, P.O. Box 97869, Pearl, Mississippi, 39288. Another option for giving is you can give online by going to Faith Family Church of God's Facebook page or the FFCOG group Facebook page and give via PayPal. Look for the green link and follow the steps that follow. You can also give online by going to www.faithfamilycog.org. Sunday morning drive-in service. Remember for that announcement on Friday. Um, Thank you so much for all of your prayers and support for Faith Family, and I believe that God is going to bring us out of this season stronger and more victorious than ever before, and He is going to use this time to bring in the harvest for His kingdom. We love you and we appreciate you, and now I turn it over to Pastor. Hey, Amen. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> like Andrew said a while ago, we'll be announcing probably Friday night. Um, they've been calling for rain on Sunday so at first we thought about well maybe Saturday now it looks like rain Saturday so just be uh just be aware and be looking for that announcement Friday evening but let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening uh, there's so many that have given in prayer requests over the last few days and God knows each and every one a lot of them are unspoken and we're living in times right now where people they have uh, a, a variety of needs so but God sees and knows every one of those let's go to the Lord in prayer Father, right now in the name of Jesus, God, we pray, Lord, that you would put a hedge around our country, God. Lord, that you would put a hedge around our leaders and touch them, Lord, and help us in this situation that we're in today, God. And Lord, reassure people that you are a God who is a very present help in a time of trouble. You know the needs in our church, uh, in our church, our local body. God, those that are sick, we pray right now, Lord, that you would be healer and provider to them, God. Those that have financial needs, God, we know you're able to meet those as well. Continue to touch and bless our people and touch this lesson tonight, God. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds that we would receive and be receptive, Lord, to what you're saying to us today. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, the lesson tonight, and we always run 
a few days behind because we don't do our Sunday school lesson on Sunday morning. We do it on Wednesday night. So we are talking about uh, what everybody was talking about this past Sunday, the empty tomb and a living Savior. And um, it says Christ's resurrection is the foundation of Christian faith and practice. This is not in our lesson, but I just thought that I would read this for a moment. It comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 23. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And the Sadducees did that back in the uh, Old Testament. They, and you've heard them how we teach our kids in Sunday school, they were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection. But it says, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. That, what, what is this? scripture saying to us it's because jesus is alive and he conquered death hell and the grave that when we die we have this hope that we can be resurrected in the newness of life through our faith and belief uh, belief in him but it talks about the foundation that the resurrection is the foundation of christian faith and christian practice my question tonight would be this what is your life or your foundation based on. In the Bible we see a story about two houses that two different men built. One house was built, and I believe both of those houses were probably built close to the same. They may have been built uh, in, in the area close to each other, but there was a difference in these two houses. One house, it was built on the sand, and the other house was built on the rock. Storms came, winds blew, and the water beat against it. And it says the house that was built on the sand, it fell and great was its fall, but the house that was built on the rock, it stood the test of time. So tonight, if you want, I, I'm, I'm just here to encourage you and tell you this, no matter what comes, because storms are gonna come into your life. I'm talking about spiritual storms, financial storms, physical storms. We're gonna have sickness in our body at times, but if we will have our faith, if we'll be rooted, grounded, and established and have our foot on the rock, we're not going to waver one way or the other. So we want to study this tonight, how we have hope because that tomb was empty. Let's look at the lesson overview. It says this lesson is based on the gospel by John. And by the time he wrote his account of the gospel, Christians had been proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ for several decades. Therefore, most of the original witnesses of his resurrection were deceased. John, possibly the only one of the original 12 apostles still living, added his testimony to the other written gospels, telling about the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John confirmed what Christians believed then and what they still believe today that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead to give eternal life so that all those who believe in him as the son of God and accept him as savior and Lord could be saved. Let's look at the lesson outline. The lesson outline says this, there was an empty tomb 
And it, it, the first part of that, uh, number one part of that outline, it says, not only were they looking for the Lord, and see, that's what people need to be doing today. They need to be looking for the Lord. All they knew then was the circumstances. All they knew is what they had seen with their own eyes, that Jesus had been crucified and he died like every other man that dies. That's all their flesh knew. The second part of this outline says seeing and believing. And we know in one place in the scripture, it says, blessed are those who have, who have seen uh, who have not seen, yet they still believe. And if you remember this scripture, Thomas, he, the other disciples, Jesus had appeared to them and Thomas was not present. And they told Thomas, they said, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas said, I will not believe. And see, that's the problem with the world today. So many people are non-believers. They don't believe that we could have a God that could love us so much that he sent his son into the world. And they don't understand how Jesus could have conquered death, hell, and the grave. And they're non-believing just like this. So Thomas said, I will not believe unless I put my finger in his side. And, uh, and unless I put my finger in the nail prints in his hand, I will not believe. But the second time that Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas was present. And Thomas fell on his knees. Jesus said, come and place your hand in my side. Put your finger in, in these nail prints in my hand. And Thomas fell on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, blessed are you because you believe, but blessed are those who have not believed and who have not seen but yet they still believe. And that needs to be us today. We need to read the word of God and by faith stand on his promises. The second part of the outline is the risen Lord. It talks about Mary's sorrow. And she had a, she had a strong love for Jesus. He had cast demons out of her. Her life had been changed because of Jesus. And see, when Jesus changes us, we have this strong devotion and love for him. Mary had this kind of devotion. So when Jesus was put to death, when he was crucified, she was heartbroken. So much grief had overtaken her and her circumstances, her situation, it had her blinded. She could not see what the Lord was about to reveal to her. The second part uh, of that second part, uh, the, the risen Lord is the resurrected Jesus recognized. At one point in the story, Mary does not recognize him. Then all of a sudden, something changes, something happens. He calls her by name, and the Lord does that with us. He knows us uniquely, individually, and he can speak to each and every one of us and have a personal relationship with us. But it says she recognized him. And one of these days, there's going to be an event, and the Bible says when we see him, we will know him because we'll be like him. And the third part of the outline is the Great Commission. It talks about the resurrection being announced by the angels. And the second part of, of uh, the Great Commission is being sent into the world. And, and I think that's what God wants us to be doing today. He wants us to be reaching out to the lost and trying to win them to Christ. But the golden text is in Mark chapter 16, verse 6. It says, You seek Jesus of Nazareth which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. They will never find the body of Jesus. He is a resurrected Savior. You can go to tombs today. These other religions say that they have gods. You can go to the tomb. They're still there. But Jesus, the body, they did not find. And they said, come and see where the Lord had been laid. That's past tense because he wasn't there anymore. But let's look at the teaching goals of this lesson. It says to impart and reinforce knowledge. In other words, that it's to instruct us. The Bible is to instruct us and give us wisdom uh, in our life. When events seem overwhelming, when we don't see a way, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. And the second part of the teaching goal is to influence attitudes and, and for people to always uh, have faith. And it says, in whatsoever state, one of the scriptures that I love in the Bible so well, in whatsoever state you find yourself, be ye therefore also content. I'm sure you, just like myself and Sister Brenda, it's in your life you can look back and you see times that you had plenty, and then you see times where you didn't have anything, 
and God blessed in each one of those times. He can bless you when you have a lot and he can bless you when you don't have anything. He can meet your needs according to his riches and glory. And the third part is to influence behavior. And if we accept that we are sent into the world just like God sent his son into the world, we know that we would be pleasing to God. We are ambassadors for Christ, representatives of him. He said that he was the light of, wor of the world and when he goes away, we're the light of the world. We're his representatives and we want to represent him well tonight. It is generally accepted among Christians that John's gospel was written near the end of the first century, A.D. 90 to 95. Thus, it was the last of the four gospels and provides a unique perspective on the life of Jesus. While the other gospels are focused mainly on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, John's gospel tells about Jesus' ministry in Judea and Jerusalem, and more than half of it is devoted to telling about the last week of Jesus' early life. Not only that, it's also focused on about seven different miracles that Jesus performed. So John's gospel is a little bit different than the others. He was close to Jesus. He had that relationship, and he refers to himself in the third person as the disciple whom Jesus loved. We should see ourselves like that today because God so loved the world. That's me and you, not just people in Jesus' day, but right now today. And the Lord loves us just like he did those disciples back then. But let's look at the scriptures in John chapter 20, and we'll start with verse 1. It says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. Why would she go that early in the morning? She was going before the heat of the day hit. She was taking spices to anoint the body of Jesus so that the decaying process, people wouldn't smell him. Uh, and, and you know, that's a horrible thing to think about, but that was the last thing that she could do to show great love and devotion for Jesus was to prepare his body for death. But isn't it a wonderful thought that while she was wanting to prepare his body for death, Jesus was busy over, over that few days of uh, time there until that third morning, he was busy preparing her for life. He was going to be a resurrected savior. He wasn't bringing death to her. He was bringing life to her. And, and in a minute, we'll talk more about that. It says, but she went early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and she came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Simon Peter, following him, went into the tomb, and he saw linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together neatly in a place by itself. Now, if you've studied Jewish customs, in, uh, back in those days, if a, if a Jewish man was eating lunch and maybe he had to get up to talk to somebody or go to the restroom, so to speak, uh, he would, if he was coming back to finish his meal, if he was not finished, he would neatly fold that napkin and lay it to the side. And that let everybody know, I'm not finished here, I'm coming back. Jesus is still following those Jewish customs. That napkin was folded neatly and laid to the side because the angel said, this same Jesus that you see going to the heavens, he's coming back in like manner. And that's an event that I want to be ready for. Amen. But it says, let's go back to the scriptures here. It says, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and he believed. Now the scripture tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God. This is the very foundation of what we believe as Christians. First, we must believe that he is, that Jesus existed. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And the next thing we've got to do is believe that not only did he come, not only was he born into a manger, not only did he live a perfect, spotless, sinless life, 
but he was crucified. And on the third morning, he was resurrected. And because he lives, we can be forgiven of our sins and we can live eternally and spiritually with him in heaven. Now that's the foundation of the Christ, uh, Christian belief. It says, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping and as she wept, she stooped down and she looked in the tomb. Her circumstances had overwhelmed her. She didn't know what had happened. All she knew, a Roman guard had been placed there to guard that tomb so that nobody could take the body of Jesus. And she sees a stone rolled away and she sees guards that are trembling or they're laying there on the ground. They look like dead men. And, and, and you know, she does not understand her circumstances and her situation. But just because you're in the middle of something and you don't understand, God is never at a loss concerning you. He sees your past, your present, and your future, and he's in control, and he was in control here too. It says, and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Today, we should know beyond the shadow of a doubt that not only is God with us because his word says he would never leave us or forsake us. And, and, and a lot of people say, this seems like a fairy tale or a far-fetched story that there were angels in this story. And every, but the scriptures tell us that the angels of the Lord encamp round about those that fear him. And it also tells us to be careful in our daily walk because you never know, you could be entertaining angels unaware. We, there's a spiritual warfare that's going on in the atmosphere and God has sent his angels to protect us in the day that we're living in. We just need to trust him and believe. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away the Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Her grief, probably she had tears in her eyes. She was so distraught. She couldn't focus on him. And see, that's what happens to us. We get so caught up in our daily lives. We get so caught up in the bills that are coming due, the financing. Maybe you've got problems in your family with different ones that don't get along with each other. And we get so involved, so emotionally caught up that God is right in the middle of the situation, but he's trying to speak peace to us. And in that still small voice, he's trying to talk to us, but we don't recognize him for who he is. And it says, she did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? People say, well, how can I find God today? How do I really know that God sees my life, he cares for me, and he wants to be involved in my daily life every day? The scripture says that you will find him when you seek him with your whole heart. If you begin to pray, call on the name of the Lord, read his word, and seek his will for your life, just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane did. He said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's when we find victory, when we say, God, we're willing to lay our will down and we'll take your will on because we want you to be pleased with us. And he says, whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. In other words, he had to be firm with it. He had to literally shout to get her attention and call her by name. And the Lord is shouting today. We've seen so many things over the past 20, 25 years that have happened in our environment. We've seen earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes. Now this pandemic, I never dreamed in my lifetime that I would ever see what's going on right now today, but there's still more things to come. I believe that we are going into what is called the beginning of sorrows. I don't believe the church is going to stay here through tribulation. I believe that the Lord is going to cut it short lest the very elect would be deceived. This earth is, is decaying. It's falling apart. 
Why? Because of sin. God created a perfect environment. When he sent Adam and Eve and he placed them there in the garden, he formed them with his own hand and he placed them there. And it was a perfect environment. But man sinned and it caused consequences to come because of those sins. And we do that today too. We sin and we go against the commandments of the Lord. And then when bad things to be, uh, begin to happen, have you ever noticed when something good happens in a person's life, today most of them take credit for every bit of it. They won't give God any credit for any good thing that's happened to them. When my word tells me that all good and perfect gifts come down from the Father above, from the Father of lights. So if something good happens to me or I'm blessed, it came from God, but the world will not give him credit for the good things. They want to say, look what I did. Look what I achieved. But when bad things happen, automatically people say, where was God in this? Why did God allow this? See, God can't win for losing with the world and the flesh and the way we think in our fleshly minds today. But God is trying to get our attention because he's a merciful God, a kind God, a loving and gracious God. And that's what he wanted to do with Mary. He wanted her to know, you don't have to worry about this situation anymore. There was something to worry about, Mary, but now you've got a resurrected Savior. I came and died for you. I didn't just live and walk with you and cast those demons out of you. I've got a good and a perfect plan for your life, and I'm here to be your Savior, not just your friend like I have been over the last three and a half, four years, but now I'm going to be your Savior for eternity. And that's what we need to accept him as, as Lord, Master, and Savior. And then we'll be changed radically. And, and then Mary says, it says, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is to say teacher. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, not only were they shut, but they were locked because the disciples... They had walked with Jesus. They had talked with Jesus. They had saw the miracles that he performed. They saw him crucified. And you know what the flesh said? If, if, if they crucified our Lord and our master, we're next. They're going to be looking for us. And they were scared. They were fearful. So they went behind closed doors and they locked the doors and they waited to see what was happening. Isn't it wonderful to know that when we're fearful, the word tells us, don't be fearful. Don't be anxious. It's not God's will that you live in fear today. It's God's will. He wants to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. We don't have to be anxious for anything. We can trust in him. It says, but the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and he said to them, peace be with you. And see, that's what Jesus always does. The Bible says, God is a very present help in a time of trouble. And Jesus said, Lo, I go with you always, even to the end of the world. When friends fall away, when family may forsake you, the Spirit of the Lord will never leave you if you'll trust in Him. And it says here, it says, He spoke peace to them. Jesus said, Peace I give, not as the world gives. I give a peace that passes all understanding. When we lay our head on our pillow at night as a child of God, the Bible says that our sleep will be sweet. We don't have to be anxious. We can say, Lord, I did my best. I've lived for you today. I'm sure I fell short. Where I fell short, give me grace and mercy. And we can go to sleep and we can trust in him that if we don't wake up tomorrow, he spoke peace to our soul and we can be with him forever in heaven. But it says... When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Even for Thomas, now all doubts are removed. Why? Because once we see something for what it is, then we can accept it. But you know, we have to live by faith. Now, faith is the substance of things so far, the evidence of things not seen. There's some things I have not seen in my lifetime. There's some things I want to see God do in the church and in the world and salvation and revival to take place. I've not seen some of those things yet, but I've got to walk by faith and not by sight. So even Thomas, he didn't doubt anymore. It says, and Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the father has sent me, 
I also send you. What is he sending them to do? To spread the gospel. That means the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead and now we can be saved. I want to go a little bit further here. I want, I want to read something that's talk about in, uh, the introduction for our lesson. It says, The story of every person's life normally concludes with his or her death. But, uh, but this is not the case with the story of Jesus' life. The fact that Jesus' biography goes on to tell of his resurrection, ascension, and living at God's right hand is forever unique. We know that uh, Elijah was carried up in a whirlwind uh, of fire, in a chariot of fire. And we know that Enoch was translated. He walked with the Lord and he was no more. But they didn't die and then come back from the dead. Only Jesus has done that. And only when he calls you by name, like he did Lazarus, like he did the widow's son at Nain, it's only when Jesus speaks to death that life comes forth. He has the power over death, hell, and the grave. And it's because he conquered death, hell, and the grave that we can have this assurance. We can have this hope. And like Paul was saying a while ago in that scripture, if only we had hope in this life, we would be of all men most miserable. But we have hope for the future. We have hope that we're going to live past the grave and be with the Lord forever. Let's go further here. It says, discussing the lesson, all the gospels confirm that Jesus rode, rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. For this reason, the first believers in Jesus as the Messiah, all of whom were Jews, observed both the Jewish Sabbath and Sunday as days of worship. Eventually, as faith in Christ spread to the Gentile world, that's us. Where the Sabbath was not observed, Sunday became accepted, uh, the accepted weekly day of worship for the Gentile believers in Christ. And people say, well, which one's right? We've heard some people say you should worship on Saturday. Some say that you should worship on Sunday. But since the resurrection, every day is to be lived holy before the Lord. It's to be a day that we tell the Lord when we get up, this is the day that you have made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's go a little further. It says, trouble and bad news are such constants of life. It's easy to, uh, to jump to a wrong conclusion, as Mary did, when faced with confusing situations. However, God, by raising Jesus from the dead, has given us a new way of looking at troubling situations. It is this, God is working for good in everything. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose, we all know Jer Jeremiah 29 11. The Lord says, I know the thoughts that I think concerning you. Isn't it wonderful to know that we've got a God that has a thought and a plan and a purpose? He doesn't want to do us harm. He wants us to do, to do good to us and not evil. He has a future ahead for us and he wants to prosper us. That's the God that we serve. Let's go further here. It says, John saw and he believed. John began at the moment that he saw that empty tomb to believe Jesus had risen from the dead just like he said he would. And to be, to be saved today, we have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, let's go further. It says, do you remember? Now, this is a question that, that our lesson poses to us. Do you remember, as John did when you first believed in Jesus as your resurrected Savior and Lord, why is this something important to remember? Because when we're overwhelmed by our circumstances and our situation, just like Mary was, that we had this hope that we know in whom we have believed and we are persuaded that he is able to keep that that we've given him until that appointed day. What have we entrusted him with? Our eternal hope and salvation. And we've placed it in good hands with Jesus Christ. The response to the word... Jesus' disciples knew, as we do, the finality of death as the end of one's existence in the world. But the scripture where Jesus said, he, you remember when he went just before he raised Lazarus, he said, he who believeth in me, though he may die, 
yet shall he live. It says they could not take Jesus' resurrection for granted any more than we can. Jesus died and was buried, and people who die and are buried do not ordinarily come back to life as Jesus did. Jesus rose from the dead for our sakes. This was the greatest miracle in all of human history, and while we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, we must never take it for granted. John could not forget when he first began believing Jesus had been raised from the dead. How many of you remember when you first got saved? You were so excited. You felt washed so clean. You didn't have all that guilt and that shame and that condemnation. Can I tell you, if you'll follow him and stay in the shadow, the Bible says, he who dwells in the shadow of the Most High, we can walk in that freedom every day. The scripture says, when the Lord sets us free, he whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. So God wants us to walk in that freedom. It says Mary's intense sorrow was based on a false assumption, a what if. His body had been stolen because she did not know Jesus was alive. We can spend a lot of time worrying about the what ifs, uh, about this or that that may happen or may not happen. Some even spend time worrying about what could have happened and did not. Blessed are we that God's gracious providence, most of the what-ifs that we worry about never come to pass. The God who raised Jesus from the dead wants us to live without anxiety about the what-ifs. God who proved by raising Jesus that he has power to raise the dead wants us to live trusting in him that he can and will make sufficient for whatever comes upon us his grace is by Jesus Christ and is sufficient for life, death, and eternity. So we can believe him from the time we were born. He said, I knew you from your mother's womb. He's been with you in this day that we live in right now. He says, I know the very numbers of hairs that are upon your head. And he already said that he would be waiting on us when we get to the other side. He would welcome us. We're going to hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. And the Lord never leaves us. His Holy Spirit is with us all the time. And we don't have to be anxious about these, these things in the last day that we're living in. I want to go to just a few more scriptures here. It says, blinded by her grief and tears, Mary did not recognize she was speaking to Jesus. It can be difficult to see things as they really are when we are hurting deeply. We may even fail to recognize that God is with us and so also is Jesus with us himself. Have you ever noticed how hurting people, a lot of times if somebody tells you they're bitter at God or they don't believe in God, it's not that they don't believe in God. If you'll take time and sit down and love on them enough, the truth will come out. They've been hurt somewhere and hurting people hurt other people and they strike out and the only person they can strike out at sometimes is God. So we don't need to do that. We need to trust God. Jesus commanded Mary to go and tell his brethren, his disciples, the good news of his resurrection. Thus, Mary was not, the on, was not only the first person to arrive at Jesus' empty tomb and the first to see the resurrected Jesus. She was also the first to tell the good news of the gospel that Jesus was no longer dead but alive. Jesus, by speaking of his disciples as brethren, signified that although they had failed him, that they were forgiven. Isn't that wonderful to know that we've all failed him? The scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the good news is if we repent, we're already forgiven. He's already paid for that. Amen. Let me read just one or two more things here and we'll close out with prayer. It says, on the evening of the day of his resurrection, Jesus made his first appearance to, uh, to his disciples that were assembled behind closed doors. They had fear of the Jewish rulers who had opposed Jesus and conspired to have him crucified. Isn't it amazing how people of that day, the Jewish leaders of that day, the people who worked in the temple, the people who are supposed to love God, sometimes those are the very ones. I don't even believe they mean to. I think it's done out of ignorance sometimes, but they will hurt us. But God will never hurt you and he'll never leave you. 
It says, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared only to those who believed in him. This is the same reality that prevails today. The living Lord Jesus makes his presence known to all those who believe in him and are chosen by him to be his witnesses. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called into an everlasting fellowship with him. Amen. I want to pray over you uh, one more time here before we go. But I want to encourage you, if you don't have that close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible talked about the day that we're living in. It said, in the end of time, there'll be a people with their lips, they'll do me service, but their heart is far from me. All it takes is repentance and confession and belief that Jesus is a risen Savior and he's conquered death. And not only has he conquered death, he conquered sin. He paid the price for me and you. The word says, having taken our sins and nailed them to the foot of the cross, making a public spectacle out of them. And another scripture that I love says, where grace did abound, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. God's grace is always enough to cover our sin. And I'm so thankful for that tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God, for all of your blessings that you have poured out on us, God. Continue to bless our church, bless our community. Lord, if we've got lost loved ones, I pray that you would touch them by the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, that you would draw them. Lord, if some of our people, Lord, are not as close to you as they need to be, God, we pray that you would send the power of the Holy Spirit to draw them and to woo them, God, and to bring them back in right standing with you tonight. God, meet the need in not only our church, but in our community around us. Help us to be ambassadors for you and help us to tell people that you're a resurrected Savior and because you live, they can live in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, church.